11. I invite you to turn there. Hebrews chapter 11, verse, we've got two verses today, five and six. All right, I invite you to stand. Hebrews 11, verses 5 through 6. Would you follow along with me as I read from God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word? By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. <laughs> and without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. <clears throat> Let me ask you, how many moments in life have you ever said or thought to yourself as you kicked back and you looked over this a uh, beautiful scene, perhaps. Now this, this is really living. This, this is what it's really all about. Um, perhaps you were on vacation. Uh, maybe you were doing something you really enjoyed. Uh, maybe you were enjoying a really good meal. And if it was that great, if it's something that you can, you know, you can say, this is really living, it probably involved other people as well. You weren't just doing it by yourself. Now, along the same lines, what dream or vision do you have of the future when you, when you think you'll finally say, aha, I finally made it. This is really living. <laughs> um, this phrase, really living, I put it that way because I think we all recognize, I think we all understand that we can all just merely live. We can all, as opposed to really living, there's just, just living, just surviving. You're, you're just alive. You, you eat, you sleep, you work, or maybe you go to school, but, uh, and, and you have a pulse. But that's about it. You're just trying to get through the day. Uh, have you ever caught yourself scrolling through social media or some app on your phone for some amount of time? 30 minutes, an hour? Who knows, maybe more. And do you ever catch yourself thinking, wow, this is really living as you scroll through? No, of course not, right? You don't say that. You use, I say some, whenever I do that, not an hour, but I'll catch myself for some um, amount of time that is too much. Thank you. I'll say to myself, Charles, what are you doing with your life? And I'll throw the phone. Um, and then of course, uh, 10 minutes later, I'm like, ooh, what's on my phone? <clears throat> but question is, what is really living? Whatever it is, it it's, can't simply be doing what you want to do, right? Because doing what you want to do often is actually the very thing that you don't want to do, like scrolling on your phone all day. All right, there's plenty of things that you have a desire for, which you know um, is ultimately destructive. Oftentimes, like I said, what we want to do is foolish or it's meaningless. It's a huge waste of time. Perhaps it's even sinful. And so really living, whatever that is, it's got to involve something more than just enjoyment. <coughs> and so I propose to you that really living, yes, involves enjoyment, but also it involves doing what you're meant to do. Or to put it more poignantly, it means doing what you were 
placed on earth to do, doing what you were crea created to do. <coughs> and the presupposition here, the unspoken assumption is that you and I have a purpose, a God-given purpose. We are not just resource-consuming creatures. <coughs> Rather, we're meant to fulfill a purpose. When you think about people who lived in the past, who really lived, boy, that, that guy really lived. Is it the pleasure seekers, the people who are just consumers who, who come to mind? Or is it the people who lived their lives with purpose? People who overcame struggles and obstacles to accomplish great goals. People whose lives had great meaning. I would, for, I would hope that it's the second category, the people who had, whose lives had meaning. So if you're still with me now, this idea of really living uh, comprises two things, enjoyment, pleasure in what you're doing, but also what you're doing has, has some meaning. It's, it fulfills a purpose. And I believe that today's example from the Hall of Faith, this is our second entry in Hebrews 11, shows us what really living is all about. <coughs> um, last week's saint was Abel, and we, uh, we learned that he barely gets any screen time in the Bible. He gets half a chapter in Genesis 4, and even though he appears for half a chapter, he doesn't even get any speaking parts. Well, this week's hero of faith gets even less screen time than Abel. Enoch appears in Genesis 5, which is, Genesis 5 is a genealogy. A genealogy is a list of people whose descendants, who are descendants of who. And, and, um, and so Enoch appears in Genesis 5 for a total of four verses. And yet from those four verses, we have this testimony from Scripture, from God himself, that holds him up as an example for us. All these many years later, he is held up as an example for us to follow. Now, uh, you don't have to turn there, but if you read through Genesis 5, it's not a very, it's not a straightforward genealogy. Uh, when you think of a genealogy, you think Adam fathered Seth, who fathered, uh, who was after Seth, Enosh, and so on and so forth, okay? Instead, <laughs> there's the, the genealogy in uh, Genesis 5, it's a little, each person gets a little entry of three or four verses. And it follows a certain structure. And this is how it goes in Genesis 5. Seth, when Seth, or when someone had lived X number of years, he fathered his son, so Enosh. And then Seth lived after he fathered Enosh some more years, Y number of years, and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Seth were, and then you add the X and the Y and you get Z, Z years, and he died. Okay, so basically you get the story of how, how old was he when he had his first kid, or not his first kid, how old was he when he had the, the kid, that went, the, the child who is emphasized, Enosh, and then how many more years after that he, he lived? And then you had his final number of years he lived. And then, comma, and he died. Now, if you ever read through Genesis 5, it's fascinating because, do you know why? It's fascinating because the, their, the, the length of their, their lives are incredible. 
they all live, with a few exceptions, 900 years or more. Okay, and so as modern people, uh, we're, we're, we're puzzled by this. We're like, whoa, how did this happen? How did they live such extremely long lives? <coughs> but actually, <clears throat> that's not the focus of Genesis 5. The focus of Genesis 5 is this. The, the, end, the end phrase of each person's little biography is, and he died. All right, because that's the and he died is not a normal part of genealogies. Right? If you read through any other gene genealogy, it never says, well, uh, you know, Abraham fa fathered Isaac, and then he died. Isaac fathered Jacob, and then he died. The, the, all the other genealogies don't mention that they die, but Gen Genesis 5 mentions that they die. And the reason it's mentioned is because death is a new thing. In fact, God did not create the world with death in it. Death was introduced back in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve disobeyed and humanity fell, and therefore, now that humanity fell, now that they disobeyed, that's why people die. So the surprising thing is not that they lived so long, the surprising thing is that they died. What is death? Biblically, we understand that death is a curse. It is a curse upon sinners, right? That's, that's what Genesis 3 teaches us. But is death just not living? One of my children likes to answer questions with, it's the opposite of, is it just the opposite? Um, is death merely the opposite of living? <laughs> Um, and I would say, no, th that's actually not what death is. Because the whole Bible teaches us, and if you have questions about this, I can show you. The Bible teaches that people who die continue to exist. They don't, like, in other words, when you die, it's not that you suddenly don't exist. Jesus even himself taught when he was questioned by the Sadducees, who don't believe in the resurrection, Jesus himself taught that God is the God of the living. After all, he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Meaning that since God is the living God, and those people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are dead, why would God continue to call himself the God of God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, unless they're still living? Okay, he's not, God doesn't give himself the name of someone who has ceased to exist. No, God still calls himself the God of Isaac, excuse me, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because they still live even though they're dead. So, death is not simply the opposite of living. Rather, death means the end of physical life. Okay, when we, when we go through a sickness, like, as you can tell, I'm, I have a sickness, all right, that is a sign that this physical life will end. Maybe not soon, but at some point, it, it's a sign that this body is not going to hold up at the end of the day. At the, not this day, but some other day. Right, death is the end of physical life. Death is the, and to, to add to that, death is the rending or the tearing apart of something that belongs together, which is soul and body. Our souls, which is the immaterial part of ourselves, and our physical body belong together. That's how God created us. But when we die, those things are torn apart. And that is a curse. But that's where, that's where Enoch, along with one other person in the Bible, whose name is Elijah, uh, Enoch is uniquely different from every other human being in the whole world, but also from every other person that's mentioned in the genealogy of Genesis 5. Because everyone else in that genealogy, their biography ends with, and he died. But in Enoch's case, his entry ends with, and he was not, for God took him. 
Everyone else in that genealogy, and he died, and he died. Enoch, and he was not, for God took him. And, and we got to understand, when it says, and he was not, he's not saying, it's not another way of saying, oh, and Enoch died as well. He's saying, no, something different happened in Enoch's case. He did not die. What does it mean that Enoch did not die? You, you might almost think, well, if God took Enoch to heaven, isn't that almost the same thing as dying and going to heaven? Dying and your soul going to heaven? <coughs> it may sound similar, but it's, it's, it's not actually, because Enoch was taken to heaven, body and soul. Whereas other people, when they die, their soul goes, perhaps goes to heaven, their body remains here and it disintegrates. For in Enoch's case, he did not experience the curse of his soul and his body being torn apart. But not only that, if we uh, understand the rest of scripture, for example, passages like 1 Corinthians 15, then it stands to reason that <coughs> it stands to reason that e Enoch's body was transformed, transformed from earthly to heavenly, perishable to imperishable. His body was transformed from weak and broken to glorious and powerful. In other words, when Enoch was was taken to heaven by God, he received a resurrection body even before the future resurrection, which has not happened yet. Enoch not only bypassed death, he skipped past glory to resurrection life. <clears throat> now, before we continue, it's, it's worth pointing out something interesting, which is that the last week's saint, the first saint that we covered, Abel, he died. He died young, and worse yet, he was martyred. Enoch, on the other hand, today's saint, he lived a full life, 365 years, that's what that represents, a full life. And he get, Enoch escapes death altogether. So you might wonder, why does one saint get to escape death while another saint gets martyred? What's the difference here? Well, we gotta understand, that the Bible does not answer this question of why does one, why does one person get this fate and another, not this fate, but this destiny, and why does this other person get a different destiny? The Bible doesn't answer why, but we do understand these two things. First, God is sovereign. God is sovereign, meaning everything that happens, happens according to the counsel of his will. Everything that happens, happens according to how God planned it. And in God's sovereign will, not all of God's people will experience the same things. However, even though God's people will not all experience the same things, so even if you look around, look around at each other, you're not all going to experience the same or similar tracks in life. However, if we are God's people, then we will all end up with the same inheritance. We might get there along different paths, maybe martyred for some, for others, well, in Enoch's case, he, he escaped death altogether. But in God's sovereignty, we might get there along different paths, but we will end up with the same eternal inheritance. God's people will all receive the fulfillment of his promise. And what we do know about both Abel and Enoch are that, are that they both enjoy the eternal inheritance. Now let's turn to how is Enoch an example for us. <clears throat> Our passage, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, says that it was by faith that Enoch was taken up. <coughs> Which means that God so accepted Enoch 
Why did God accept Enoch? Because of his faith. God was so pleased with Enoch because he exercised faith that he rewarded him by taking him so that he, he should not experience death. The thing is, our passage in Genesis, guys, you, you know I'm, I'm talking about Hebrews and Genesis. Hebrews is talking about Genesis. The passage in Genesis does not mention anything about Enoch's faith. Instead, what it says is, if you read in Genesis, it says Enoch walked with God. Now, what does that mean? I think it's helpful to compare, once again, the other entries in the genealogy with Enoch's entry. For everyone else, it says this. For example, Enoch's father's name was Jared. Jared lived after he fathered Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Someone lived after he fathered his son this number of years. But for Enoch, the first part of the sentence has changed. Instead of it saying, Enoch lived, it says, Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. So th this is my point. Whereas everyone else in the genealogy, it's mentioned that they lived. In Enoch's case, it's mentioned that he walked with God. So let me put my spin on it. Everyone else merely lived. Enoch really lived because he walked with God. And why can I say that? Well, because everyone else lived and then they died. Enoch walked with God and he did not die. Everyone else's life, they had a normal life, obviously, because they're just, their entry is no different from anyone else's. Everyone else's life was a prelude to death. Enoch's walking with God was a prelude to even fuller life. Everyone else, no matter how long they lived, Methuselah lives 969 years old. Everyone else, no matter how long they lived, they were dead men walking. In other words, they, even if they lived a th almost a thousand years long, they, their destiny was to go to the grave. In Enoch's case, he was a living man walking with God, and God changed his destiny from the grave to heaven. So again, everyone else in the genealogy merely lived. Enoch really lived. I hope you can see that. His destiny, the fact that he escaped death and he received eternal life in the presence of God, wasn't this random, like, uh, this random mismatch with his life on earth. Rather, his destiny being taken by God to heaven followed the trajectory of his life. And so he really lived on earth and he really lives in heaven because there, it's, it's the same path. What is really living? I propose to you that really living more than any of the other things that you may have thought of, that's what really living is, is walking with God. And what does it mean to walk with God? Doesn't the imagery tell the story? Can, I mean, God doesn't have a human body. He doesn't have legs and a torso. But in your mind's eye, there's you walking and there's God walking. You're walking together. You're living life together. And so to walk with God means to have an actual relationship with God, a, a living relationship with God. <clears throat> How does Jesus define eternal life? Jesus tells us in John 17, eternal life is knowing you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And so walking with God 
which is to have a living relationship with God, must mean knowing God, really knowing Him, personally knowing God. Now, if you have a relationship with someone, it's only one part of the equation for you to know the other person. But also, the other person has to know you, right? If you, if you, know, who, if you know Bryce Harper, you know all his stats, but he doesn't know you, guess what? You don't have a relationship with Bryce Harper. And so, if for us to really know God, it must mean that we must be known by Him. What does that mean to be known by God? Well, what I'm not talking about is known by Him because He's sovereign, because He's omniscient. Of course, He knows you in that regard because He's God. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Him knowing us as our God, as Notice the pronoun, our God. The Bible teaches not everyone can legitimately call out to Jesus or to God, Lord, Lord. Because there will be some who cry out to him, Lord, Lord, and what will Jesus say to them? I don't know you. So how can we be in such relationship with God that we truly know him and we are also known by him. Something more is required than, well, yeah, uh, in the past when I've gone through tough times, I've prayed to God. Uh, when I had a test this past week, I prayed. When I uh, was struggling with depression, when I was struggling with issues in my house, I prayed. Something more is required than that, because you know what? I would, I would venture to guess that 90%, maybe more, of people throughout the world have gone through some valley in their life and have offered up a prayer to God. And so what is required is not simply that you've prayed at one point in your life, what is required is to, be, to truly know God and to be known by Him. What is required is covenantal allegiance. To be in covenant with God. Because God has given us a way to be in true relationship with Him. And that way is through a covenant relationship. <clears throat> and you know that word covenant implies something more than a casual relationship. The word covenant implies something more than a relationship of convenience. If you're in covenant with, with someone, it's got to be more than, uh, yeah, I, I call them once or twice a year. I check in every now and then, right? If you're in covenant with someone, it's, it can't be shallow, it can't be superficial. The only other covenant that we know of is what? Marriage. And if you're married, that's the most important, by definition, that's the most important relationship, human relationship you can have. And likewise, if we are in covenant with God, that's the most important relationship you can have. And in Enoch's case, it's not just that he was in covenant with God. It's, it was more than that, because technically, if you're baptized, if, it, if you guys are, if you are baptized, you are already in covenant relationship with God. But just because you're in covenant relationship with God does not mean that you are living according to the covenant. Right? The warning of Hebrews that we've been hearing all along is, is, is watch out so that you do not turn away from the covenant. In Enoch's case, not only was he in covenant relationship with God, he led a life of covenant obedience to God by faith. He <coughs> strived by faith to keep God's commands. 
He strived to be conformed, not only in his outward actions, but in his inward man, that is, in his heart. He, he strived to be conformed to the will of God. Enoch, even though he literally did not walk with God, like walk, God was not literally by his side as he walked, Enoch, by faith, lived in God's presence, by faith. And so to summarize, Enoch strived by faith to please God, to do that which is pleasing to God. Have you ever tried to please someone? And by that, I'm, I'm being very specific here. I don't mean maybe I can get them to love me. Maybe I can get them to respect me if I do this for them. Well, that would be trying to, trying to earn their pleasure. That's not what I mean. <clears throat> I don't mean this either. Oh, I got to do this thing, this chore, or this, this duty, or else they will get angry at me. Oh, it's anniversary time? I must get these flowers or I will be destroyed. I don't, mean, I don't mean trying to please them in that way either. I mean, I really want, I really am looking forward to that smile on their face. I'm really looking forward to uh, how they're gonna respond when I, when I surprise them with this. That's what I mean. You, you try to please someone. You're not trying to earn anything from them. You're not trying to avoid their wrath. You just want to bless them. And in Enoch's case, he lived his whole life desiring and doing that with God. And he, he accomplished it. He, he did please God, which is why our Hebrews passage says, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Enoch didn't merely please God in moments here and there, sometimes, sometimes here, sometimes there. Enoch lived his whole life in this way. He walked with God. And that pleased God. And this I propose to you, Again, this is really living. For God himself to say of you, I am well pleased by you. This is really living. To walk with God in this life as with a close companion, as with a close friend. This is really living to know and to enjoy the author of life, the one who, from whom every blessing flows, right? We sing that at the end of every worship uh, service. Praise God from whom all, every, all blessings flow. To know him personally and to enjoy him. This is really living, to have true fellowship with the Father of lights, from whom every good and perfect gift comes down. This is really living, to feel the, sh the, the shining face of the Lord upon you, because he is pleased by you. And it's not so much that you've, you've earned his... The emphasis here is not on the fact that you've earned his favor, but that you live by faith. That's how we're meant to live. We are meant to live like Enoch, walking with the Lord. That's what pleases him. And that is what is, that is, biblically, that is really living. But of course, this, this doesn't happen automatically or mindlessly. Like, it's so tempting for us to hear us, and we're going to, if we continue in Hebrews, we're going to hear 
maybe a dozen, maybe, I don't know, maybe more sermons on faith, because that's what this chapter is about. And it's so tempting for us to walk out of here, oh, yes, I got to believe. I got to live by faith. But, that, but then, like, what does that mean in practice? Right? What does that mean in practice to live by faith? It's, it's just kind of like background noise. It, we, perhaps, perhaps you might think the application is like, whoever, who, who, do any of you turn on music in your house, not because you're listening to it, but just as like background noise? Does anyone do that? N- no one does that. Some people do that. You turn on this background noise. So is this what faith is? You turn on some Christian music, some Christian tunes, really low, so you don't, you're not really like listening to the lyrics or anything, but it's there in the background, so you know, ah, oh, i got some Christian feelings going on. This is, and that, 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 that is not the application of, of, this, of, of these sermons, of, of living by faith. Turn on the faith background noise. Our passage says, <coughs> faith, we're, we're now looking at verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please him. Faith is the condition for pleasing God, and it looks like this, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. Now, this is, This phrase is not suggesting that all you need to do is merely merely believe that a God exists. That's not what this is saying at all. No, the author of Hebrews is saying that you must believe in the true and living God, the actual God, the one that he's been talking about all this time. Who, Who is that? Yahweh. The God who spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days has spoken to us by his Son. He's talking about the triune God, the God who has revealed himself to us in his word. And so, faith is not simply believing that there is some God out there. It is believing in the God who is true and living. But secondly, this faith that is pleasing to God, whoever would draw near to God must believe that he rewards those who seek him. Again, this doesn't merely mean believing that there is a system of rewards and punishments, that there is an afterlife and that there's gonna be some who receive punishment, some who receive reward. That's not what this means. Rather, he's saying, you must believe in the specific rewards that God has promised. The book of Hebrews, but also the entire Bible is full of giving us, giving the people of God specific rewards, specific promises. This is what is held out to you. There is an eternal inheritance that awaits you. There is, there is heaven that awaits you. There is, above all these other things, what awaits you, God says, is me. I am your reward. And, and I think this is something that we shouldn't skip over quickly. But who of us deserves God to be his reward? Do any of you, do any of us deserve God to be our reward? Just even thinking of that should blow our minds. And yet God offers himself to us as our reward if we would live by faith. Because faith is pleasing to him. And so now, once again, how do we exercise faith in our lives? I've, I've already told you that we should not think of faith in terms of background noise. Because, because that's not a thing. That's not something that affects us. The, the thing about background noise is you tune it out, right? It's, it's just there to, to provide a mood, perhaps, but it doesn't, it's not something that you, that affects the way you live. So we must think of faith in terms of concrete, discrete terms. 
I'm going to read verse 6 again. It says that without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Exercising faith happens in the context of drawing near to God. That's how we exercise faith. You got to, there, there has to be a concrete and a discreet drawing near to God. Just like if you're, to give an example, to have, to have friends with someone, well, how, do you, how do you know you're friends with them? If you never hang out with your friends, um, I would say to you, maybe you don't, they're not your friend, right? And so part of friendship is to be together, whatever it might be, enjoy a meal together or do something together. And then when it comes to, when it comes to our relationship with God, we must draw near to God, not just turn on the background noise of faith, whatever that is. But we've got to be careful when it comes to drawing near to God. We can draw near to God like Cain, who only drew near to God outwardly. He only just came to church, but he didn't come by faith. He didn't come, um, he, didn't, he didn't come wholeheartedly. So we got to be careful of that. But on the other side, let me ask you, can you have faith without drawing near? Can you have faith if all you do, if you don't draw near to God, but all you do is turn on the, the background noise of faith? And I, I would say to you, that's impossible. You cannot ha- have faith if you do not draw near to God. If you're not drawing near to God in worship, you are not walking with God. And if you are not walking with God, then you're certainly not pleasing him. Let us not be fooled into thinking that you can have faith, you can have a faith that is pleasing to God without drawing near to God. And so, let's end on this note. What is drawing near to God? It is to worship him. This is what we're doing here. What we're doing here and today is not simply to learn about God as if God cares most about whether or not you have the right theology. God does not, his, he does not care the most about whether or not you know the right things or the wrong, or, or, or if you don't believe in the right things. No, what we're doing here, what we're doing when we gather together on the Lord's Day with the people of God, what we're doing here is, at least we should be tr- striving to do, is drawing near to God. We are here to walk with God. We are here to know God and to be known by Him. We are here to enjoy Him and to receive blessing from Him. Not only are we receiving blessings from Him, we are here to bless Him. Bless Him with our prayers. Bless Him with our worship. We are here to be reminded of our covenant obligations. And that's partly what we hear through, for example, the confession of sin. We're reminded of our covenant covenant obligations through the sermon. We're here also to be forgiven for the ways that we have not lived according to the covenant. That's what we do during the confession of sin, to be forgiven for the ways that we've fallen short. We're here to offer up to God the best of what we have to give, like Abel, who brought the firstborn and the fat portions. We're here to offer up to God our tithes. What I'm saying is, if we draw near by faith, this, what we're doing here is having a vital and a living relationship with God. 
So let us do that week in and week out by faith. And God promises us as we do that, that we will find out that what we do here is really living. In fact, as we, as we saw with Enoch, Enoch really lived because what was the outcome? Well, he was taken up right into God's presence. Let us pray. <clears throat> uh, God, we thank you for Enoch's example that he walked with you in such a way that was pleasing to you. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to exercise faith in our lives, especially in these moments when we um, come to church to draw near to you, to, to enjoy you, and to have this relationship with you. We pray, Lord, that you would enable us to draw near in, by faith and that you would bless us, your people, when we find that this truly is living. Um, this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.